Well, hello, everybody. It's <laughs> Top Line, your favorite podcast, unless you're most of the world, which hasn't heard it. But for you, you're hearing it now. Thanks for listening. If you're not watching the YouTube, you're missing. AJ upgraded his home studio setup like a bowth. Oh, man. Like this a bowth. Was- this was a this was a labor of love. It was a lot of fun. I had I had the lighting. I was telling both Sam and Austin before they joined, before we went live, that I have all of the lights. I have a halo light. I have a key light. I have a disperser. So I mean, I'm just trying to drive like our YouTube. Mr. Traffic. Rogers, you know, like welcome to the neighborhood. Like <laughs> put on a card again. Tie your shoes. Just come on into AJ's AJ's warm, inviting abode. <laughs> yeah, it's so talk warm. About market. It looks so nice and inviting. You're right, like warm. It seems warm. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah you when you look guys, healthier. You look healthier. You and, and I look now pale right now, good. Sam. We look pale and sickly. <laughs> AJ lost all this weight, but in bad lighting, it, did, it was like, oh my God. He went to the hospital. But now he actually <laughs> looks good. <laughs> what you guys don't know is this is the first time I'm wearing a collared shirt on top of you. That made all the difference. I eat you up, you little devil. I want to I <laughs> a little mint colored shirt. I want a little mint ice cream. Just like a little put you on a cone. Here we are. <laughs> put you on a cone. Put you on a cone. <laughs> Here, here's what we're doing, dear listeners. Here's what we're doing, dear listeners. We are making you pause your Spotify or your Apple podcast and go to YouTube so that we can jack up our listenership right yeah, now. Yeah, so please do. do. I mean, um, we're all going to be up Upgrading our home studio setup soon, but um, I'm going to use "put you on a cone" so much in life. It's one of the best things I've ever had. Like it's so good. I'm going to put you on a cone. Yeah. Now, now all of the listeners out there know who the first mover and shaker of the three of us are. Who the real entrepreneur is. You are the. You are the. You've got. You've got an exit under your belt. That (laughs) this is why. This is why. Welcome to Top Line, the podcast for the best founders, operators, and investors in B2B tech. Every week, AJ Bruno, Asad Zaman, and me, Sam Jacobs, will break down what's important for you to know to be the most well-informed professionals in the market. What do the revenue leaders at Google, 3M, IBM, Shopify, Square, and Cisco have in common? Their teams all use SalesLoft to hit their number. SalesLoft is the only platform that's designed for the way revenue teams work every day, so sellers can prioritize and take the right actions to get more deals done, from prospecting and deal management to coaching and forecasting. No more guesswork. No more wasted time on non-selling activities. Follow SalesLoft on LinkedIn to learn more. Episode 59, approaching 60, Asad Zaman, CEO of Sales Talent Agency, AJ Bruno, CEO of Quotapath, and Sam Jacobs, CEO of Pavilion. Let's We're back. Go. Thanks let's. for listening. Okay, so let's jump in. We have let's fun things in. to discuss today. So the first is NRR and churn. So our friend Ray Wright, he, he just published some data on NRR based on an analysis from 1,500 private SaaS companies. And he showed, A, that public NRR had decreased from 120% at the median at the beginning of 2023 to 110% today. In the private markets, it's decreased from 105% at the median in 2022 to 100% in 2023. Okay, interesting. David Spitz, though, another great friend of the pod, had another related post on churn that I think is very fascinating. So he thinks NRR is a red herring since it distracts from the fundamental issue of churn. And he gave an example. Company A, 20% churn, 25% upsell, 105% NRR. Company B, 5% churn, 10% upsell, 105% NRR. Similar results, but dramatically different spend to get those results. If you have more churn, you have to do more to get to that 105. And so he shared that in 2023, public SaaS companies spent a median, a median of $2.40 per 
dollar of net new ARR from a sales and marketing spend perspective. And that was up from a dollar fifty in twenty twenty one. So the question everyone was asking was how could this have happened? Why didn't go to market leaders cut more when they knew twenty twenty three was going to be challenging? Was it that they didn't cut back? Or was churn a much bigger issue than we thought? And we never had a way to figure this out because they don't separate uh, gross revenue retention versus net revenue retention. And you previously didn't have a lot of visibility into sales commission payments, which can be used to triangulate what's happening in a go to market team. But now sales commissions are amortized. So they show up in financial statements for public SaaS companies now and they correlate to net new ARR. So he used this to try and get a read on churn. And what he found was that in many cases, sales commissions were flat or even up over the last few years. So that means gross ARR bookings were not the issue. Instead, it was churn. Sam, one of the themes has been that we've had in this pod recently has been trying to locate what the root cause or causes of these issues are um, that we are seeing in the market, which then enables us to allocate resources appropriately. What does this data and David's narrative tell you about root cause or causes? I don't think it's anything that we haven't talked about already. I think that I just think it's very interesting the way, particularly that Spitzy, mm. uh, which is what his, his closest friends call him, they call him Spitzy or Spitzface. Spitzface. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, the, the fact. I, I just think it's really interesting that commissions, exactly to his point, right? Like that sales commissions as a percent of new ARR have increased so much and it's because new ARR hasn't been going up as much and sales commissions have been focused perhaps on expansion revenue to mask bad gross retention. Mm. What does this mean? What are the root causes? The root causes are tighter budgets, point solutions that are being consolidated for larger platforms, key workflow solutions like Salesforce or HubSpot that are baking in price increases. They're adding in new functionality. That functionality may or may not be as good as a point solution uh, competitor. But when they are demanding five, seven, you know, Salesforce's basic contracts have 7% price increases baked in annually. So if the budget is being eaten by platforms that already have preeminent market share, then other vendors, other companies are going to suffer. Uh, Fun, you know, objectively, and the reality is that um, that puts everybody in a very difficult position. I think the other thing is that again, like when budget dries up, a lot of things that I hate to say it like this, but nice to have, uh, you know, are pushed to the side for the need to haves. Frankly, you know, learning and development is a nice to have most of the time, and most of the investments that companies have been making in upskilling their their labor force, you know, if if workflow solutions and productivity solutions are competing with learning and development which has much more abstracted outcomes than productivity increases from some kind of technology solution productivity solution my experience is that the heads of enablement and the cro's and cmo's of the world are inevitably going to choose the technology solution the productivity solution in favor in uh, in favor over uh you know the learning and development investment they might make obviously i'm talking my book here because um and, you know, that's what that's partially what we sell uh, at Pavilion. And we've seen a big impact to big headwinds from organizations that are much more rigorous around their spend. And, you know, the answer, I also function, you know, fundamentally think to what we talked about last week, that the other part of this is just a continued questioning of the subscription model. Uh, you know, as I've said many times in a lot of different places. Fundamentally, the customer is the person that decides whether you're in an ongoing relationship. It's not that you can write a, a contract to say that you're in a recurring relationship. They might sign the contract, but if they strike the auto renew and they immediately send in a cancellation notice, then clearly they've bought it for a specific reason and they're going to use it for that reason and then they might, they might depart. Which is why a workflow solution like Quotapath is better positioned in these kinds of instances than a than a learning and development solution like Pavilion, because you're going to pay your sales team commissions every single period, but you might only need a specific skill that you can get from Pavilion in one period for a specific part of your team. So where does that leave us? I was on a conversation 
with Guy Marion, the CMO of Chargebee, earlier today uh, for a, a webinar that we're doing. If you're listening to this on Sunday, we're doing it this coming Wednesday. And it was this entire conversation about what's the future pricing model of all of these solutions. Because I think what mm-hmm. happens, as we've talked about product market fit, is that usage-based pricing becomes more preeminent. And then there's some hybrid that emerges that is some combination of a platform or recurring fee that is attached to ongoing utility that never goes away, that is persistent, right? Obviously, the classic example would be AWS, and probably the first example, and maybe the second example is Salesforce itself. But there's a persistent use case, and then there's a transactional use case. And I think the customer is going to push companies like Pavilion towards the complexity of usage-based pricing simply because that's how they want to buy and engage with the product. And what that means is that a lot of revenue that is now called recurring will not be called recurring anymore. And if you are, uh, which is, I think that the final thing I'll say before I hand over the microphone to the man in the warm lights is uh, the final thing I'll say is it just the the ultimate question that is being begged is is actually is even more fundamental, which is how real is SaaS? And and when I say that, what I mean is you've got bankers. If you go to meet with a banker uh, or anybody that wants to sell your business or help you find liquidity, they're going to say you need to th- you need to turn this into recurring revenue. You need to change your contract so that it becomes recurring revenue. And again, I come back to that point of the customer fundamentally decides. And if all of this revenue, I think there's a a big percentage of revenue. I mean, I think it's probably half that is called recurring across the ecosystem. That definitionally, if you look at the underlying uh, dynamics of the flows is not recurring. And the question is, is that the death knell? Like what's, is it that it's, is it that all of these businesses are not worth as much or is it that predictability doesn't come from contract structure. It comes from your ability to show that customers come back time and time again for some kind of ongoing use case, whether or not you call it recurring revenue. And my instinct is that it's closer to the latter, that all of us are going to be building businesses that when you, when you parse apart, if we do a conference, if we do GTM in Nashville in 2023, and it's freaking awesome, right? And all of the vendors decide to renew their agreements with us and we sell out inventory uh, well in advance. You know, we're about a quarter of a head of where we were last year for GTM 2024 in Austin. I'm not going to tell you that's recurring revenue. It's not recurring revenue. And certainly Saster would say the, the way that they're getting beat up time and time again means that it's not recurring. But is there some level of predictability? Yeah. Doing things, doing the same thing and getting better and better at it every year would would probably indicate some level of predictability. So even if all of this revenue isn't quite recurring revenue, it doesn't mean it's not valuable. And I think there's probably a counterforce that comes in as everybody is saying, well, then if it's not recurring revenue, none of these businesses are worth what we think. There's probably some counter argument, which is, well, they're not quite discounted back to the level of an agency or a services business if there's some level of predictability. <laughs> so sales talent agency has dollar zero in recurring revenue. We've been around for 16 years. We don't have any recurring revenue. We have tons of predictability. We can forecast, we can predict. We have customers that have worked with us for many years in a row. Um, I think y- your point is a really strong point that we have to separate. We have to stop obsessing about enterprise value and trying to design around maximum enterprise value in many cases and focus on the fundamentals of business. Do I have a repeatable, predictable, scalable engine? Is it running efficiently and effectively? Those things really matter. And for some companies, they are truly recurring revenue businesses. The ones I'm talking to are my friends and services who sit with me at dinner and say, I have 10 million in ARR. I'm like, how? Like, what type of ARR? And then they tell you it's it's basically an auto renewal and a one-year contract. And that is just not recurring revenue. AJ, as Sam was talking, it, it made me think of the conversation the three of us were having with a friend of ours last week, um, an elite CRO who is going through um, a pricing evaluation. 
Mm. And this is something that is going to happen more and more in our ecosystem, right? Because one of the things that this shift that AI is enabling leads to is one questioning seed-based pricing as being the most viable approach, because if fundamentally every company will have less employees per million in ARR or per million in revenue, then that's not the best way to price is based on employees. So it might be usage, it might be a hybrid, as Sam said. One thing that I found interesting there was the implications of moving to usage based on the upside and the downside. Um, that this, it's not as clean cut of a decision that you just made this shift and it's going to be fantastic. There's a lot of risk in the equation as well. I'm sure you're wrestling with pricing a little bit as well. Can you talk about the implications of moving from um, uh, traditional SaaS pricing, seed-based pricing to usage-based and why there's upside and downside risk? Like, can you bring some light to that? Yeah, uh, I'll talk to that. And then there's a ton of things that Sam went into that I want to like either ask questions of Sam or, or, or loop back to. I'm just, I, I don't know, this whole HD that I'm coming in. He feels in more is, professional, is, doesn't he, Sam? It feels like, like a totally different <laughs> ball game for me. Um, on the per-using upside downside, I think the thing that our, our mutual friend was talking to that I thought was really fascinating was the board conversations that they were having. And that ultimately going to the board and saying like, hey, there's this X million dollars at risk. This is something we know we're going to have to move to. Are we okay with putting these tens of millions potentially of dollars at risk? And that puts a really, that, like, that was the really interesting question that I think every CEO, founder, CRO, CMO should be asking and making sure they're getting complete alignment from the board on these sign-offs. When you're moving per user pricing to usage base, and maybe you're going all in on usage base, you're like, the world is going to die. You're in a, I don't know, CX. CX is a good example. CS is a good example where Gen AI, Gen AI or SDR, they feel like real threats. And if you have an opportunity to change that pricing model, you're, you're, you're a first mover and shaker by doing it now. Um, and so that was the, the conversation on that upside downside piece of it. I don't have a really great answer other than we're going through, we constantly every six months go through pricing and packaging. And I feel like on the sales side, it's not as much of a risk just yet. Though the conversation that we've been having on commissions and what David astutely like identifies here is like, hey, let me flag something that we're all talking about. Sam said it. These are topics we've been discussing this entire time on top line, but let me flag something on commissions. <laughs> so I would say that the uh, opportunity there is to really like dive into that. It's really fascinating. And if you think about it, it makes complete sense. We're trying to hold on to our, our top sellers. We have a leaky bucket. We know the cost of acquisition upfront is going to be more expensive. We're going to pay now 25 to 40% for that upfront deal and are willing to do it. But the, the fact of the matter is that that number has probably gone up. We've discussed this sales to earnings ratio versus quota to OETE previously. And I think we're going to see a lot of that data start to come out um, in, in for quota path in the like private markets and what that looks like and, and uh, show that. So I don't necessarily know what the end game of this looks like, but I do appreciate the we're focusing on the wrong metric. We should be focusing on GRR. Um, and I think most companies are. I think most CEOs and founders. I want to loop back to some of the things Sam said, though, that I just really found interesting and fascinating, the e-learning tools and like the leaders leaning in that are curious. Uh, Kyle Norton led a great conversation. Our friend uh, Kyle led a great conversation with Stage 2 Portcos, and it was around go-to-market tools and AI. And I, I thought it was really fascinating because I'm not sure all the leaders, CMO, CRO, are having weekly calls with the newest tools that are coming out. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think we've all shied away from a budgetary standpoint and we're using what we know, the, the sales forces or whatever of the world. And we're, we think it might be a distraction to go see. Maybe you, you all, you both have like different data on this, but I'd be curious to understand how many CROs and CMOs are out there are doing two to three demos a week with new tools that are out there? Not many based on what I know, right? Like I've spoken about this a lot. I think people are just not prioritizing this enough. I don't do two to three a week, but I'm doing like one a week. And I think it's important. I really appreciate what Pavilion is doing, which is making getting these demos more efficient for people like us who are very busy. You can go join a session. There's like eight demos. I love that. Um, but Sam, what are you seeing on this? 
on whether people are yeah like really, are people prioritizing this they're not right like I think people are talking. I, I think people are acting like they're prioritizing it, but I don't think they actually are from everything that I'm hearing. But I, you know, I, you, you both are two of my main sources of information. I will say again, I was just on this webinar dry run with Guy at Chargebee, and they, they did a survey, and 46% of people that responded to the survey saying they're looking at increasing their investments in AI over the next 12 months. But that runs. But but what does that actually mean? And are they actually doing that? To the to AJ's point, there's very few people that are actively demoing two to three new solutions yeah. a week. And a lot of people are still trying to figure out what is the use case that AI makes sense with. And and you know, there's two use case there's probably three that I'm familiar with. The first is sort of personal assistant style. Uh, support and oh, wow. I've commented about this company that I've been talking to. This company Fixer, uh, Fixer AI that you know handles your inbox and helps draft responses and helps integrate your calendar. So that's a good use case. That feels pretty good because it drafts potential responses, etc. The second is um, data enrichment, right? So you grab, you have somebody's LinkedIn. You can go out to LinkedIn and do uh, use AI to s- skim the page and then write a summary of who this person is. And then you can plug that into some kind of mass personalization at scale. So you can use AI to get a fuller picture of who the person is and connect disparate data sources. And then you can use AI to, um, uh, to you know, send a message that is personalized to that person. Uh, we're doing that particularly with you know card abandonment emails for Pavilion. So Josh put this workflow together where if you fill out some of the information, we ask for your LinkedIn profile. Our AI through Copy AI, Kyle Coleman's company, goes out, enriches the data, and then gives gives the the chapter head actually a, a two click option to just send an email saying, "Hey, I saw that you're on the Pavilion website. Here's you know, know that you're interested in X, Y, and Z." Um, Etc. So that's another use case, and then you know I think the the third use case to the point of what AJ uh, you know Asad uh, and this elite CRO are talking about. I think like the big place that AI will come in is is around support and around eliminating customer support teams for the most part and having a smaller number of orchestrators that coordinate and consolidate. Um, so I but are is everybody trying it? I think you really need. You you need some, you know, the word technical is a very interesting word, but because I don't mean you need to code, you just need to be a tinkerer. Yeah. And, um, and, and if you're a tinkerer, I feel like AJ is probably a tinkerer given the, the way that he built that studio, but because, <laughs> um, because you don't need to know how to code. You just need to know how to use Salesforce or a CRM. You need to know how to use Zapier or make.com. Uh, and you need to know how to use, um, you know, chat GPT and, a, and an open and a natural language API. And if you know how to use those things, so we've got a couple of tinkerers at Pavilion. Josh Carter is oh, one sure. of them, our director of demand gen. And Tom Andrews, our, you know, head of, uh, of business, for platform business insights. I forget what he calls himself. Um, That's a good I'm happy to support him. Whatever, <laughs> whatever I but we have tinkerers. And if you, my, my sense is that if you don't have tinkerers, which just sounds a little silly, but if you don't have those people in your organization, the curious people that are doing stuff on the weekend to like try and figure this out, then yeah, you're going to be in a much different position. I, I have Sam, a, I'm, Yeah, go ahead, AJ. I, I was just going to say, I'm not, I'm not, I, I thank you for calling me a tinker. My team's going to uh, laugh. I, I think there's a lot of found, founders or tinkers by nature, but I don't necessarily consider myself a tinker. I consider myself curious and want to learn, but I only try to hire tinkers. And that's the thing that I think you're saying as well. And what I love it from it is like, take Brandon Smith, our, our sales ops leader, he's the one that put the clay.com and the kind of like the outbound motion in play. And I just sat down with him and said, like, well, teach me how clay works and how we're doing all of these things. And he literally just walked me through it. And that was just awesome just to see how we're doing it to your point is, and in the same conversation with Kyle, that clay was mentioned, it was like, you have to be kind of technical to understand what to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the that's the interesting thing. The conversation I asked, or the question that I asked during that group, it was a group of founders of startups and uh, some folks at later stage companies was, hey, these are these AI go-to-market platforms are all pretty new. Who's signing annual contracts with them versus like monthly? Because you don't know what their situation is. And everyone's in a monthly contract with these companies. And it seems like they're just seeing how the market will play out. So something to think about for all of you. 
Um, Austin, I also want to go back to something you said, maximize revenue, which was a really smart way to say something I've been thinking about is that CROs, when they're doing their planning or forecasting, we're not thinking about these things that David Spitz talked about with commissions. Commissions is one example of P&L that I think has just changed quite a bit. And so that's one area where I would say we should like be diving in and better understanding our business when we talk about these things of unit economics, because clearly these public companies are struggling to understand some of this and we're seeing those pieces of it. So how can we expect private companies or startups even that have nowhere near the resources to be able to dive in? But as CEOs or executives at these companies, this is where we need to be doing the dirty work and understanding how these numbers actually hit the business, hit the bottom line and the top line. I think the the big company versus small company part is interesting, AJ, because if you think about when it comes to dexterity with, let's say, commission plans, you could argue that the smaller companies, as long as they have access to the information as to what to do, might be able to implement change a lot easier than a big company. Like right before this, I brought off a call um, with a company that's doing a billion in ARR, and we're going to help them with about 100 hires right now. And one of the challenges they had was that the, the market's been so volatile that their headcount plan got approved in Q1 late. And you've got revenue numbers tied to that, right? So now we're behind on the hiring plan. We need to quickly fix this problem. Great. Like we love, we love situations like this, but it just tells you that it's hard. It's hard when you're that big and there's so many decision makers involved to be able to make those changes. Whereas if you're a series B or C stage company, I think you can make these changes a little bit faster. This, sure. the thing that I found interesting about the the use case on services is if you look at Klarna, we've we've mentioned this slightly in the past, but they were able to automate the work of 700 employees, which had a $40 million impact on their bottom line. Um, I don't know if this is public yet or not, but I believe is trying to get rid of most of their support team um, and automate the majority of their support work. And when we say this, we're talking about level one and level two support. There is still a third tier where you connect with a human being, but that does have a huge implication on this. I think the challenge I think there's a mindset shift that has to happen, or at least there are people with this mindset who will have the advantage, which is in a market where interest rates are higher, everything's a bit harder. And if you can gain a competitive advantage over others, that's really powerful. But early adopters, if they pick right, gain those competitive advantages. So all these CROs and everybody else, founders, CEOs that are trying to create momentum, if you're not at least looking to see, is there something out there that I can sink my teeth into that gives me an edge in this market? I think you are kind of hurting yourself as a business and as leaders as well. Like there is this mindset shift that has to happen that I need to be an early adopter to have a competitive advantage because once a CRM is used by 80% of the ecosystem, there's no advantage of having a CRM. But if you were one of the first 50 companies that had a CRM, there was an advantage. So I think there's, yeah. there's that as well. Yeah. I think, what, you know, one of the things that was interesting was I was talking about usage rates pricing with somebody and the person responded, well, there's like, that adds so much internal complexity for the vendor. If you're going to sell usage-based pricing, it's not just sales commissions. It's yeah. tracking and attaching data to the usage and making sure that forecasting, forecasting all of the board prep, it's all of that stuff. And it seems to me, to the point of product market fit, that that is the tail wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. That the idea that we should solve for what's internally efficient and not yeah. for what the customer is asking for sure? feels completely um incorrect to me i think if we know what our we know what our renewal data is we know what our gross retention is we know how our buyers are buying we can choose to accept that or we can try to build a product that people still like but they want to purchase it differently and if we say well it's too internally complex to reconstruct that solution so that we can sell it to people the way they want to buy it well somebody else will figure out how to do that instead of us and so i think you know working backwards to your point asset earlier working backwards from enterprise value as opposed to from what the customers want you know i'm on this um, 
I've got this talk track with Jocko and we talk about investor value versus customer value. Who's dictating the, the, the strategy and the roadmap of the company? And in a world where investors are dictating the strategy, because you're burning capital, because you're going to need to go back to investors, the capital markets at some point, you have to write recurring revenue contracts, yeah. even if the, you have to avoid, you have to say, well, it's easier to forecast, so I'm going to sell it this way. Whereas when the customers dictate, because you're focused on being profitable, you have to figure out, okay, they're asking for usage-based pricing. They're asking for consumption models. I'm going to have to go figure that out yeah. because I can't, I can't really afford, because the math isn't working anyway. I can't yeah. sell something that has 50% gross retention and say that it's recurring revenue anyway. And there are companies that are they're built around consumption-based, usage-based plans, sales commission, all of these things, because it's so difficult to figure out that actually go out and help you bring in the tools. The forecasting that I mentioned earlier, I I know of three or four companies in the usage base that are just still challenged after years. And then also the close process, it takes a lot long. The billing has to like run for days at a time to be able to figure this out. So it's one of those challenges that's not solved yet. And I agree with you. It's like a PLG, like turning PLG just to turn PLG. It doesn't make sense. But this is where the advantages lie, right? So if you if you do it now and you get it right, so this mean, this is not just doing it. It means doing it and getting it right. So if those two things happen, you have an edge over the rest of the market, which you won't have when 100% of the market is doing usage-based pricing. The thing that really stood out to me in that conversation we had last week is people are going to bet their careers on this right now in the near term like if somebody is pushing through a significant shift from let's say seed base to usage base and if the upside and downside risk is let's say many millions of dollars for let's say a company that's series b series c that that stage that growth stage if you get it right you're king or queen if you get it wrong you're out like this is this is that hard um and that that that's tough that's tough to develop the conviction to be able to do that okay Hi there, I'm Andre Bresso, go-to-market leader and chapter head of the Pavilion community in Amsterdam and a big fan of Topline. If you're a COO or sales executive, listen up, because this is something you won't want to miss. Mark your calendars for June 6th and head over to Boston for the Pavilion CRO Summit. You get to hear from top-notch practitioners like Mark Robert from Stage 2 Capital, Heis Davis at Gradient Works, and Aaron Bates of Crossbeam. They are diving into the essential topics every go-to-market executive needs to dominate in 2024. Register now at joinpavilion.com forward slash CRO Summit and use the code TOPLINE to receive 20% off your ticket. Enjoy. So let's talk a little bit about... By the way, that's the patented acid transition. He says, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that means, that means uh, open hash, BR, close hash, open hash, BR, close hash. <laughs> Two line breaks. I can't understand my brain topic. now. <laughs> There's like it also okay. in line with Sam. So what does this all mean? Let me, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... In the, we, we don't talk about product releases a little bit. So over the last two weeks, everybody, including my mother, has seen all these releases from the large publicly traded companies that are integrating AI into their products. You saw Google with their, uh, uh, their conference or their show, and it was really powerful. They showed some really cool things. What was interesting for the sake of this discussion was Google showed a lot of stuff that won't be available for many, many months. They took that strategy. Let us show you what we're cooking. You're going to get some of it today and some of it in a few quarters from now. OpenAI came out and they had their release and their stuff was available immediately. You can go on and you can access it right then. Microsoft just released their computers yesterday. um, And that was also an OK release. It made me think about the private markets a little bit because you don't see 
private companies do as good of a job as these public companies in creating excitement around their product releases? Like, I'm excited about what Google is doing. I'm very excited about what uh, OpenAI is doing. Like, there's a vibe there. Private companies don't do this really well. And so this is something that we can probably learn from when it comes to these organizations and implement on our front. So AJ, as a founder, how do you think about releasing features to the market? Should we be doing what Google does, which is tell you what's coming for a, a year from now, do what OpenAI does? Like, What are your thoughts on this? I think OpenAI uh, releases the products the same day because they're trying to beat Scarlett Johansson's cease and desist. That's what they were trying to do. <laughs> they were trying to just say, we have it. Sorry, it's already out there. I, I'm, I was Sam altman out anyway. I'm just so yeah. tired of him and his vocal mannerisms and <laughs> listening yeah. to him pontificate. Same. Have you, am, okay, so this is sidetrack. But if you ever listen to him and then Robert Kennedy together, like back to back, your oh, head will hurt so much afterwards. I can't listen to Sam Altman anymore. And it's just so, it's the way capitalism works that the person who invents the thing gets to opine on the underlying social implications and the overall broader human trajectory of it. And I, it, I find that it's so conflated. The fact that Sam is CEO of a chatbot of OpenAI means that he is also king philosopher. Yeah. on what AI means for the future of the human race. And so we've all got to ask Sam, what does Sam think about every <laughs> single friggin' thing? I cannot listen to him anymore. I really wish he would go away. And this whole <laughs> Scarlett Johansson thing is, for me, it's just so... Because he tweeted her. Yeah, he did. Yeah. tweeted yeah. it. So yeah. it, he, he thought, it's just the way that he just, he's like, we're just going to do it because I feel like it. They reached out to her. Yeah, they reached out no. to her. So they asked for permission and she didn't give it. And then he still tweeted out her, which means he didn't really care if she gave permission or not. He didn't care. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm just, it's fine. OpenAI is an awesome company. I, if I never hear his voice on a podcast again, it'll be too soon. <laughs> All of, all of that said, I do think OpenAI is doing the right product releases. <laughs> no, I agree with that. that. Also, I agree to, with that. To, uh, that, like, that immediacy, everyone's chasing Steve Jobs. Everyone is chasing this like showmanship. Here's the thing. It's out in stores. Like, go race and run one more thing. And uh, this is hitting me. This hits right, right in my heartstrings, Asad, because as the head of marketing at Quota Path, <laughs> uh, we, have, we have a really big release in June, and I am running that release. And the collaboration, and I am in the weeds on QA of the product and making sure that we're doing the right things, having the early, um, the early testing, uh, early access program for each of these features. And let's say it's like six features, it's seven features that we've been working on the beginning of the year. And I think this tells a huge story for Quota Path. It's like our next milestone in elevating it to That's take, something really, take something really complicated and streamline it. I'm super excited about this launch. And so we're building momentum to it. I had uh, Kelly write the press release. Uh, so she's, she like took it and it was basically journaling for her of taking all of the features and then the why behind it. What's the customer benefit? What are we trying to say and communicate with this release? It will all be immediately available June, uh, sometime in June. I can't say what date in June, but it will be available. And the, that is the right way to do this. But how are you going to, as a startup, right? Or as a growth stage company, when you look at OpenAI, Google and Microsoft, they can tell journalists to turn up and journalists turn up. They can say, we're going to do this and people like me will go and watch that YouTube clip. Um, they will release things that are life-changing to some extent. So there's like this level of excitement around it. How does a growth stage company, even just if you click into getting eyeballs on it, how do you get maximum eyeballs on it? What are you guys you doing to get maximum eyeballs? Uh, you buy a really fancy studio and you just make you your CEO start a look great with two other <laughs> great CEOs. <laughs> I, I, I do think it's I Sam's point is just so on point with the C, with Sam Altman in terms of now he's on the one end of the spectrum. But I was talking to a demand gen leader at a company that the three of us know really really well. They've been in the news and the C and his challenge was that the CEO did not want to be in the limelight. 
and did not want to be the thought leader and the thought partner. It didn't matter if it was evangelizing the category, which this company is, is, is oh, doing. Wow. But you probably, the two of you, I will say the name of the company, I bet neither of you, I'm not going to say it right now, oh. neither of you will know the name of that CEO. And that's the really interesting thing about this. So what ended up happening is that all of the executives underneath had this political fighting of, I want to be the voice, I want to be the leader. So like the question is, if Sam Altman, in an alternate universe, if Sam Altman gets fired, who's the voice of OpenAI? And it is OpenAI where they are today if six months ago or a year ago, whenever that happened, Sam isn't the CEO. It's a solvable problem. Shopify CEO wasn't the most public facing. He had his CEO who became president was kind of is still like the CNBC guy when it comes to Shopify. Sure. When yeah, you look at Zuckerberg, he was he's recently become market facing. Prior to that, he was pretty he was pretty shy of the limelight. And you had other people that would go out and share the narrative and create excitement. And I think there are various ways to solve the problem. But I do think that start. Uh, I, I don't disagree with. I, I disagree with uh, on. Zuckerberg, by the way, like that's that he he was front facing day one, and really? he always has. Been I think there was a period yes. when Cheryl was like more more doing press interviews, yeah. and it was always a picture. Like if you imagine sixty minutes, it was like Cheryl and Mark walking together, yeah. down you know yeah. some. But the Social Network came out. Like the Social Network was a movie, and I, so he went to this retro conference, and he got killed on stage. All like, right, because he was like wearing the hoodie, and he was, he was all wearing sweaty. a hoodie. He started sweating. He said something about we let Nazis stay on the platform. Like in essence, like he was like trying to say because of free speech, we wouldn't do this, mm-hmm. and he just got destroyed on stage over there. And I think he like ha- was anxious about it for a while, but now I think he's a gangster in public. It's just so cool to see, which is also we all evolve and change over time right like we become comfortable with things that we're uncomfortable with initially um so what so in your mind aj just to like distill what you were saying private companies should focus on this more they're not doing it well enough there should be a coordinated effort in terms of what are we releasing and what is the benefit in it for the customer and then how much effort are you putting in as the vp of marketing i like how you gave yourself the cmo title as the vp of marketing what are you doing to get maximum eyeballs on it like are you talking to customers one-on-one are you publishing this somewhere like actually what are you doing to get eyeballs on it I mean, a good example is that our head of pro- Andy is going to be in SDA's office talking to Lydia about this release. Like that, we are talking to customers one on one and really trying to make sure we have the benefit. And it, it, there's opportunity for us to make changes to some of these features for maximum benefit. Uh, but I think the internal opportunity to evangelize for CEOs and founders is a really important one and it gets lost because it creates momentum. It continues to do it, especially when you're in seasonality businesses, quota path seasonality, and you have these summer months. It's how do you create momentum and how do you create quota path is change. seasonal? Q1 and Q4. Yeah. If you think about comp plans, how often do companies change their compensation plans? Oh, got it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Sam, you have actually out of the many people I can think of being quite communicative with the market. Like I remember when you were making some shift, like you had this big call with the ambassadors on it, which are basically your advisors. I remember coming off that call and I like, I knew what to say to people about pavilion moving forward. And I thought that was impressive. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on this, like you you do a good job here. What are your principles? What are your thoughts? What's your advice for these early stage and growth stage businesses that are trying to do this well? I don't know that I do that good a job at it. Better than most. I, the idea of a product, a vaporware announcement where you say this is a thing that's going to come out in 12 months, I cannot imagine something more useless. What a waste of energy. That is so stupid. <laughs> I think the way people should release products is exactly the way OpenAI does. And I that doesn't mean that I want to hear Sam Altman talk about it, but it does, or, or see some picture of him, or I just, I, even looking at him, <laughs> gives me the creeps. Anyway, so upset by it. it's just so annoying. It's like, why do, why does this guy, this one guy, gets to decide the future of the human race just because he negotiated really well? Really I, I like in one sentence, Sam goes, "Yeah, Google, you're so dumb," and Sam Altman, you're a jerk face. <laughs> I didn't say jerk face. I don't I even know it. if he's a jerk. I, I, anyway, the, the Scarlett Johansson thing really turned me off. But the point is, I definitely agree with the way they release products. The way, yeah. 
and, and the biggest pro- the biggest product I think that nobody's gotten to use is the Sono thing. I think the one that like creates the videos from uh, from text, and that's. But the thing where you're like, hey, we've got this big announcement. It's now available to you right yeah. now. I can't imagine a better product release yeah. strategy than that. So they're they're really really good at that, and I think. I don't think I'm really the, the main thing I think about when I think about telling people, I think two things. The first is, and this is by the way, true about sales comp plans as much as it's true about product releases. What was the biggest mistake? And, uh, and Sam Slevin's listening to this. He, he'll probably, he may or may not remember this, but, uh, we had this goal for basically the point is this, um, the, the few times I've changed a comp plan, and told people about it without any input from the people that it would be that would Im- that it would be impacted by. Uh, there's been near mutinies, oh, and wow. people have said, "Well, you didn't think about this edge case and this edge case, and you really didn't think this through." And the and the, the way that anything works best is if you get the buy-in of key supporters and stakeholders yeah. along the way. So the the first thing I would say is you you articulated acid, which is I'm really trying to not make big changes without having a group of people from the community itself be aware of those changes and already supportive of those changes. The big change that we announced last week uh, to the chapter heads was that we're bringing the associate members back into the chapter construct. And they hadn't been part of chapters uh, since we brought them back uh, about a year ago. And they will be back and we're going to be investing much more into the associate membership going forward. So if you're an associate member out there, just know that there's been a first of all there've been a lot of improvements already so some part of product releases is releasing the product and just not telling anybody we now have mentoring available to all associate members we have pavilion uh, connections where you can connect based on matching criteria that you want to other people that you want to meet we are relaunching functional groups for SDR managers and frontline managers and et cetera. and then the last piece of it was bringing associates back into the chapters well we'd already told a bunch of key chapter heads that this was happening beforehand. So when I ha- I'm on the call with 50 different chapter heads from uh, all these different cities and another 50 are going to watch it on demand, I know that I already have the support of people that are in the audience and they can cheer it on. They can say, I've heard this decision and I support it. So one thing I think about these decisions is, is make sure that you have the support of the, like, No, it should not. And this is the same thing for board meetings. Most things should not be a surprise to anybody. That's one thing when you're trying to build consensus. And then the last thing I would say is, and also you can't do that many things. You know, Mm -hmm. one of the challenges we faced this year is we're just doing a lot of different things. We've got uh, last week we had uh, uh, Elevate, which is a quarterly virtual event. We have virtual demo day. We have Pavilion Palooza coming up. We have our go-to-market conference in Europe, in London. CRO we have our summit. CRO summit. Like we're doing a lot of stuff. And in the midst of that, we probably want to announce to everybody that associates are going to be part of chapters. And you just kind of pick your battles because there can be there can be any clear signal repeated. Uh, too often becomes noise. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like in, you can say the most yeah. interesting thing, but if you're if you're saying things all the time, it becomes hard for anybody to filter out what's important versus not. Any th- signal said often enough becomes noise. That that's really sharp. Uh, Austin, for you, how I mean, where what, what would you consider launches at STA? Like, yeah. do you have opportunities to do these type of launches I was internally or externally? This. Actually, like I, the reason I wrote this um, as a dotted point was I've been thinking about this a lot on the services side of the world because services companies don't do anything. You know, product companies still try. Like most services companies will announce like new geographies or new practices and divisions and things like that, but they don't talk about the advancement of the solution as much in in the way that I think product companies do. I think for us, it would be sure, like we, we went, if you go into a new geography or a new vertical, you can make announcements there, but it, that's not that interesting to the market. I think what the market cares about the most is your delivery. And so the delivery function, like the uh, the actual solving of the problems that you are engaged to solve. And the core difference between services and product in my mind is when you buy a product, you know, give and take what you're getting. 
um, this tangible value that you're going to be able to latch onto, and it trades in a range based on your implementation of it. But you know what you're buying, and that's that stands true for a tissue bots, a CRM, or any other product you get. In the services world, you are taking a leap of faith in many cases. I think they got this for. And there are various reasons why you might take that leap of faith. The niche focus, you, you're a celebrity getting divorced. There's a divorce lawyer that focuses on celebrities. You, they'll know how to do, do it for you well. So you look for signals to give you confidence to take this leap of faith. But then you're hoping that they can solve this problem well for you. And these problems overlap with others, but they're unique as well. So you really are the thing that matters most to, I think, a buyer or a customer is your ability to solve problems well. And I think what we should be doing a better job of is communicating how we are improving those capabilities internally. This quarter, here are the things we've done. And here's the actual material impact it's had on how we solve problems, how well we solve them, how efficiently we solve them, how cost effectively we're able to solve them for you customer. Or here are three things we're doing that are going to be play out in that I think there's a huge opportunity, at least for sales town agency, we're going to start doing this, communicating a lot more about the craft itself versus just us as a business. I think people care about that less and more about the craft. If they think you're very, very good at this, then they'll buy from you more and more. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. It is definitely that level of service and ability to see the craft piece of it makes the big difference. And I wouldn't think a, a product launch or a launch in general or the new practice area, like you said, like that doesn't doesn't hit the radar yeah. for me. Why? Why the would that? Thing, the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, there's this book that everybody's read, Play Bigger about category design and within play bigger they talk about lightning strikes mm. the other thing you got to do is you got to consolidate all your energy into one thing yeah like th there has to be a campaign that's coordinated and again the problem with doing too many things is how many campaigns can you run so that's why you have to pick your moments and then you have to organize it orchestrate it correctly so that everything hits all at once we did a lightning strike in 2020, 2021 with uh, Compub. We released this thing called Compub that was a, a, like a place where you could go and do quota to OTE calculators. And it was really fascinating to, to have the lightning strike and see like 10,000 people show up. But then we didn't invest in it at the um, start of the next year as much as we thought we were going to. And that really tailed off because it was this static model that was like a cool novelty. But if you're going to do it, I think the other side of this on product launches is just what's the follow through? Yeah. How are you ensuring that you're making the momentum? And this is what lightning strikes talk about as well, of just making sure that there's actual real value, which to the point Austin was making on services, that's like where actually all the value is. But for product companies, you have to build this thing. I think, uh, Sam, you said vaporware. Thing in 12 months, but it's true if you're announcing something that you release to the world that also feels like vaporware, that just kills the momentum of the launch. Yeah, which all of it speaks to like, let's make sure we're prioritizing what we're working on and prioritizing initiatives because you only get so much of somebody's attention at any one time. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so last but quick topic. This would be a fun, quick conversation. So I was listening to a podcast um, and it was Sarah Tavel, I think I'm saying the name correctly, from Benchmark on 20VC. And she made a point that was really interesting. She said that you should be embarrassed by the CEO you were six months ago. And basically, the, the premise of her point was that, and she said it holds true for any type of role, but the idea being that you have to keep evolving and improving and changing. Your business changes, the needs change, you have to change. Toby from Shopify has this framework that you have to almost like reapply to your role every year as a CEO and say, based on where we are, am I the right person for it? What skills do I need for it, et cetera? And so was curious to just actually understand from you guys how you are different today from six months ago, what led to that change? Um, let's start with AJ. AJ, how are you different? now versus six months ago as a CEO? <laughs> I am embarrassed, Asad. I, was, I am very much in that bucket. We all gave shout outs to our CEO coaches last week. So let's start there, that that's something that we all recognize that we're working on and improving. Um, I am different in every, th every which way. I would say a year ago, uh, I sleep nine hours. I'm sleeping straight through. I'm eating better. I'm running. Uh, I'm, I am doing all the things I can. I'm changing my calendar. 
I doesn't mean that I'm, I figured it out. And with startups, they, they, these things change, but I'm trying to really hone in and focus on the thing. I think the biggest difference outside of the calendar, which we all talked about in our Slack channel and it was brought up a couple of times. The biggest difference is I'm just saying no to, to more and I'm just trying to make sure I completely clear my daily prioritization list. And that's probably what's been the most helpful in terms of just being a better CEO. And I think Sam nailed it when he said, we have all these priorities. What are we actually going to prioritize? And it's just that constant, constant change and shift that we're, we're all going through. Um, How did you make I, these changes? These are really fundamental. They don't happen. And this was a question that my CEO coach asked me. He's like, what was it? Well, there's a confidence piece of it. There's hitting financial plan. There's um, me looking at myself in just a general. I mean, I'm down 25 pounds this year. I wasn't huge or heavy to begin with. I know Asa thinks I need to gain weight. I'm sorry. This is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to... Like Strong my wind is right going to knock you over at some point. Oh, get out of here. I, so I think that a lot of that was just in a mental... I have to like... Th- this. I don't know who says it. It was in a book of just like waking up and smiling more. Mm. You all have heard this and how stupid and silly it is. But it ultimately does have a state change in a Tony Robbins way. And so like that was the thing for me. Now, granted, I'm feeling this way, but I know there are a lot of other founders and CEOs that I've been talking to that are not feeling this. And so I have to, being a better CEO is being more empathetic to those conversations, including with my team and my executives. And so when I go into those conversations, just bringing it back down to the level and not showing up and be like, hey, check this out. I have this beautiful studio uh, that I'm, I'm working out of. It's just more of like, hey, what are you working on? What are your problems? And what can I help you solve? And being present, 100% present, whether it's in this session and recording and really listening and taking it in, or just with my family at dinner and not having the phone at the table. Those are a lot of little things, those atomic habits that had added up to what I think has been a monumental, massive change in my life in the last six months and a better CEO. Sam, (laughs) how are you going to follow that? This guy is a different human now. (laughs) I am not. Uh, <laughs> I love you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, listen, I definitely, uh, listen, here's the truth. Uh, I, I definitely, I think this is the best I've been as a CEO. I could be wrong. For sure. Um, why? It's a lot of the stuff. I'm just doing what AJ is doing, but on a much smaller scale with worse results. Uh, but <laughs> I'm in shape. Yeah, I um, I've been getting better sleep. I've been eating better. I have reorganized my calendar. I've been better at not def. I, I've written about this, but people say, you know, let's hop on a call. Mm. And my instinct would be sure. And now it's talk to Aaron, talk to Kathleen, or why don't you write me what you need, and we'll figure out if we need a call. And so I've reclaimed my days. I've also just become much more able to persist in a, it's hard to explain, but I am far more patient about how long things take. Mm -hmm. As we talked about last week, I think, you know, I am thinking in terms of 2027, you know, I'm looking out two to three years, both on a personal level and a professional level. I am, because I have reorganized my day, because we're profitable and I've made the decisions that were necessary to get us there. And because I'm organizing my activities around talking to people that I care about and interacting with people that I get joy from and energy from, I've also feel like I've increased the enterprise value of pavilion by not focusing on the enterprise value of pavilion. Isn't that wild? Yeah. That's how life works. You know, it's the law of attraction. And so once you're happy with where you are and I'm, I feel confident that uh, we're building something of meaning and purpose. And so I, but the biggest thing I would say is just the, the time horizon and just having structuring my day so that I can do this for as long as I need to do it. You know, mm-hmm. what's the next thing I'm most excited about? I'm most excited about getting my home office to look like AJ's mm-hmm. and to uh, and to develop that. And I'm excited for CRO Summit and I'm excited to go to GTM EMEA and I'm excited to 
do the Hamptons weekend for CEOs that we're going to be doing August 1st through 4th. And I've just got like a lot of great stuff happening and I'm just trying to find the joy in the moment, even if uh, there are times when I'm like last night, randomly overwhelmed by the amount of change in my life and by how different I am. You know, my life is completely different from what it was a year ago. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. that can be insane. That can be really terrifying. And sometimes it is, but most of the time, you know, honestly, for me, exercise is, if I, if I get a workout in, if I get a sweat in, I feel like I'm on the right track. I think that's the right thing. Sam, what I heard you say in there is do the activities that energize us, that give us that energy, but that's, that's not life. We can't always do that. And there are plenty of things in our personal and in professional that are going to be a challenge. We can have a, a letter from a lawyer show up to our desk one day. We can have a tax bill that we didn't know about just show up. We can have an unexpected um, person leave the company. We can have all of these things. And I will just say it's just perspective. They, there are challenges in that moment, but taking a step back and pause on it and just saying, you know what? This activity is not going to energize me right at this moment in time. I know I'm going to have to tackle it. I need to be doing an energizing activity and then maybe I can look at it. Maybe I need to go for a run, clear my head, and then I can look at it. Um, and I think that's what I heard uh, you say, Sam, in some of that. It's, yeah. it's so interesting that so much of it is around. It can be boiled down to resource allocation, right? Like your time, but literally just the time element, like giving yourself space to be able to decide how to deploy that time on any given day to energize you, I think is, is, is something that at least I struggled with a lot. Like I used to have just back to back days of like five days a week, crawls, meetings, crawls, meetings. And then you realize, is this even moving the needle? And you give yourself mm -hmm. some space and you're like, oh, I can actually get stuff done. I think for me is, is the last point Sam made, which is time horizons. I think I'm thinking of, I want to be in the field for another 20, 30 years. I'm not looking to make a bunch of money and get out. I'm looking to make a bunch of money and stay in. And because I'm thinking in decades now, I feel like I'm able to think about things in a way that are giving me more conviction and confidence and hence calmness around the journey we're on. I want to win, but I don't need to win tomorrow, um, but I will win. And I think that's just, it. it's nice for the nervous system to have that type of time horizon, that type of thinking. Um, yeah, that's been a huge one. So that's the main one for me. I, I, and, and I think AJ made, I feel like, first of all, AJ is like rifling through my papers because he's talking about unexpected tax bills and letters from lawyers. So <laughs> get out of my office, AJ. <laughs> You're not welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> my private space <laughs> but it's really it's not about do you get thrown off your center it's about how quickly can you come back yeah. to your center and do you have tools and, and my tools are better my tools are better because even on this podcast i'm getting text messages from somebody that i you know and they're they're but i'm not so distracted that i can't be present mm. and it's like how do you deal with those spikes those cortisol spikes of yeah. like, okay. And, I, and I'll say that I've gotten some feedback, negative feedback, meaning people saying, I can't, I check my, I don't know why I do this. Maybe I'm scared, but I check my bank accounts for Pavilion every day when I wake up and I check uh, my personal bank accounts and my investment accounts every day. And I have a spreadsheet and I have a cash flow forecast, both for myself and for the company. Wow. Now, does that, is that healthy for me? It gives me a sense of control. It gives me a sense of everything's fine. I know how things are working. I know the inflows and outflows. And for me, that confidence, particularly about the inflows and outflows of Pavilion, that's made me more confident. That made, that's made me understand the rhythm of the business and not panic when we hit slow periods, which we will over the course of the summer. So for me, information and not shying away from the difficult information, oh, yeah. not, you know, you got to read that letter, process it, take a break and then come back to your life. So your ability to like come back to the center after being knocked off the center for me is the sign of growth. 
Mm -hmm. Almost, it seems like that's what makes a good CEO. Because, like, if you're a CEO, you're not spending most of your time in areas that are working really well. That doesn't mean you don't do things that don't energize you. Like for you, it's content, Sam. But when you're clicking into other pieces of the business, a lot of the times it's like, I don't think that's working well. Let me jump in. Let me see what's going on. Let me get prioritization, resources, etc. You jump back out. You go into other areas. So you're you're problem solving, firefighting a lot as a CEO, and you have to be able to reorient yourself because by nature that you're going to have a higher and high, if your business is doing well the volume of those occurrences only increases as the business's complexity increases and you being able to manage through that your nervous system through that it becomes such an important skill that's really interesting what you just said yeah. ah. And Sam, uh, this camera is just so powerful, it goes and sees inside your office. So I'm sorry about that. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you can respond to the lawyers for me. (laughs) Do some of the work at least then. Um, Okay, shout outs. Shout outs. Uh, I will give a shout out to Kyle Norton, who is uh, just fantastic. He's a longtime listener of Top Line. I got to meet him firsthand last week. Uh, Ryan Milligan had a fantastic conversation with this week. I heard him speak in front of stage two. He's very impressive. Great Saster podcast that he was on. Uh, he Jason Lemkin's on the board of one of his company or of, of his company Owner dot co. And uh kyle's fantastic so really impressive and has really great frameworks so if you haven't checked him out you should uh he's awesome and second shout out quick shout out goes to alexa the ceo of pocus oh, uh, had a really great catch. But yes alexa grable yeah she just moved to new york recently so sam should uh message her or if she's one of those people in your inbox that's waiting for a meeting you you should take that uh, <laughs> and I, uh, just really could catch up with her. She just got married recently. Um, and she's really in this category creation, been in this like product led sales, thinking about what's next. I feel like I haven't heard much about the category, but it feels like, uh, Pocus has, has won that category, but there, there's like, what becomes a bigger opportunity and what does that look what do you like? Mean is, had a really great- can you win a category when you're like 50 employees though? Like I, they yeah, seem amazing, I like, but I don't think you can say they won a category. Like that's a billion. I don't think. It, I mean, the question is: Is it a category to begin with? Then yeah. is that like, like was that a I real think category? Categories are one when they're like meaningful market. Sure, market exactly. And I think that was the point: is like that wasn't maybe a real category. So what does the real yeah. category look like? But we had a really great brainstorm, and I think uh, she's she's really onto something super smart and and sharp, and has some great um, funds that have backed her like first round in code. Let's two, get her so into the CEO I, pavilion. Yeah. Done. You're in New York and you're not a CEO and you're not in CEO Pavilion? Come on. You just moved there to be fair. <laughs> That's why I did fair to Alexa. Those are my two shout outs. Okay. I'll go next and Sam, you can wrap it up. Um, mine is very quick. I This morning I was listening to a podcast, um, 20 VC with Aaron Levy and the bots founder CEO. He is just such a sharp thinker and thinks about b2b all the time like sometimes when you're listening to podcasts the the hot people to have on the major podcasts all these b2c people or like google ceo microsoft great like very informative but i learn the most when i listen to guys like him that are deeply focused on the enterprise and what it takes to sell and create momentum in the enterprise and where things are going i think he is sharp he's shrewd um, and we're lucky to get to hear him um so it's a podcast that i think most should go listen to is very relevant for people that listen to this one i love i love aaron levy He's so smart. He's so smart. His smart. Twitter get, is so good. It's great. It's great. And he's great on AI right now. Yeah. I've got a couple shout outs really to members. Uh, Luigi Milardo. Luigi was the former chapter out of Barcelona, and mm-hmm. he had an exit. He sold the company that it, where he was CRO, uh, I think, Wolfu, uh, which is like a video streaming platform, I believe. Um, and I hadn't talked to him in a little while, and I just caught up with him today. And that was fantastic. I also caught up with David Apple, and I recorded uh, 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 a, a whole thing for the Sage live finance event that what's well, i guess it's recorded since i recorded so i guess it won't be live but david is a huge supporter of pavilion i think he runs global sales or some big piece of business for sage uh, which is an accounting and, and fpna platform that has a bunch of different products and services associated with it and um it's always great uh i also do want to give uh, a shout out 
uh, to um, uh, the guys at Fixer. Uh, their two brothers, uh, Archie and Rich Hollingsworth, uh, who are the two founders. And um, I think I might might start working with them in a more formal capacity. But you know, it's this AI, this virtual assistant AI platform that I've been finding a lot of value uh, at. You can try it out for free. Uh, I think you go to Fixer AI or Fixer.ai. You can Google it. And um, also just want to give a shout out to the team at Chargebee. They've been big supporters of Pavilion. They're speaking at Ciro Summit. I'm speaking at their conference next week. And I've uh, developed a nice friendship with uh, Guy Mary and the CMO. So those are a few of the shout outs that I have for everybody. Thanks for listening. That's great. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, that's it for today's episode of Top Line. And um, we'll talk to you on Thursday for Top Line Hotline, everybody. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap for today's episode brought to you by SalesLoft. SalesLoft helps revenue teams take the right actions to close every deal with the only platform built around the seller's day. Visit salesloft.com to learn how the world's top revenue teams hit their number by using SalesLoft. Thanks for listening to Top Line. New episodes come out every Sunday. If you like what you heard today, subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave a five-star review, and share it with your friends. Don't forget to join our Top Line Slack channel to connect with us and discuss the topics we cover with other listeners. Click the link in the show notes. Lastly, if you're interested in joining Pavilion, you can learn more about membership at joinpavilion.com forward slash membership. Thanks again for listening.